My name's Kath and I'm the Creative Director for Conservation Without Borders. This is my boss Sasha Dench and she is the CEO of Conservation Without Borders, otherwise known as the UN Ambassador for the Convention on Migratory Species, or more dramatically, the Human Swan, which she was named after she flew from Russia back to the UK tracking the migration of Buick swans. Next up was the Round Britain Climate Challenge with Sasha flying around the UK to highlight climate solutions. But days before the end of that expedition, in a freak accident, she fell 150 feet. And while she broke a lot of bones from her jaw down, she somehow survived. Despite many operations to put her back together and six months in hospital, she was determined not to let injuries deter her from out on mission. So against the odds, in 2022, she set off with a team to follow the osprey migration from the UK to Africa, living out of vehicles and tents. She set off in a wheelchair and came back walking. And with amazing results and stories to share. In this vlog, we will share some of those stories and take you behind the scenes of life of Conservation Without Borders. It's been a pretty spectacular afternoon watching them. This is we go and the incredible people we meet along the way. While Sasha provides updates on our mission, her recovery and showcases life on the road, me, I will spend most of my time in Zambia trying to work with five cats and wildlife that also doesn't see borders. Also, hopefully I'll be able to showcase some of Africa's incredible places and people. I'm in Mindo for the bird fair I'm also investigating the efforts to bring back the vulture specifically the condor here and one of the people I'm off to meet is a guy called Jan who's employed by a hotel who's decided to help with the recovery efforts by funding a breeding program. Uh, condors are monogamous one oh. for life which sounds cute <laughs> but doesn't help because in captivity you have to find the match and so you can try couples that just don't work uh, and so you have to switch birds until you find a spark. <laughs> uh, and what does well, a spark look like in Condor world? Uh, courtship. You have some courtship. So um, at least no fight. That's the first good thing. And then if it goes even better, you have courtship. Both individuals do it. Uh, it's a dance. Wings open. Uh, close one to each other and spinning in front of each other. Um, and so, so yeah, so we finally have a bit of uh, results in, in that part also. We, it's been four years in a row now, we have one baby. Uh, and so those birds, yeah, it's not just to have birds in captivity and, and, and have babies. The, the estimation for the country is 150 individuals. So What should the there be? Have you, have you any idea what kind of, what would be considered a healthy population? Some people say that considering the size of the country, something around 1,000 would be good. Wow. Well, far from that. And, and well, and the rest also uh, about the challenge about breeding. One egg every other year. And don't breed at best before nine years old. Oh my God. So to give you an example of the frustration we may have or the passions we may have, uh, we had a young female last year we don't talk about breeding with her till 2032, 35. And I also asked about the stories we tell about vultures and how that has an impact on how we see them. A lot of people think condors can take a cat, a cow, a kid. Vultures cannot grab. They, they, they don't have the talents that eagles and, and hawks and kites have. You're never going to see a condor carrying something. It, it, it's a big chicken foot. Um, I didn't know they couldn't carry Yeah, no, every time you would see or you hear a legend or see a painting of a condor flying above the mountains, we, it's just impossible, it's physically impossible. But a lot of people don't know that. And then I was introduced to Sebastian Pohn, who's been working with condors for years and offered to explain how people here see the condors and hopefully take me to meet some. Sand condors themselves are very important, uh, not just for the ecosystem, but culturally here uh, in Ecuador. Even from prehistoric times, there was a strong connection between the local indigenous people and condors. Uh, and even after our independence uh, from the colony, we, uh, we chose the condor to be our national bird, our national symbol, and its presence in our flag you know so it's Ecuadorians ourselves have a very strong connection with condors 
but for me personally, I used to go out mountain climbing uh, all the time when I was in, in school. And, and any time I saw a condor, I just got really excited and I would forget that we'd be at 4,000 meters elevation and just started running up to try to get a picture of the condor. And I always had this strong connection with them. Uh, and eventually we, we started uh, well, me with my family, we started a rescue center. This was 2002 uh, to house a condor that an, uh, an NGO wanted, needed some help with uh, to try to rehabilitate, to release. So that's when I, I got started. They are seen differently, you know. The uh, other vultures are somewhat seen as, as dirty. Condors are not. They're majestic. They're big. They're, they're a sign of... of power of, of knowledge here in, in Ecuador. You know. we can't talk about vultures and only look at the condors. Martin explains that they also work on the less revered black vulture. We know that we play a really important role in terms of rescuing wildlife. Yeah. Uh, you have to consider also that here in Ecuador we are in the most densely populated country. So we have lots of people living in a really small, a really small portion of land. Um, but one of the consequences is that we have Commonly, uh, with these animals, with black vultures, we have car crashes. So, uh, uh, it is common. Because they're eating the roadkill. Yeah, they are uh, eating roadkills and, and they have yeah, accidents. So, we receive commonly uh, these vultures here. Uh, we try to uh, rehab them. In some cases, we are successful. We've been releasing some of them. But we also keep some of the uh, injured ones as part of our education programs. So, we have one of these uh, one of these animals uh, playing this education role. They do quite look like a puppet. Uh, we published a paper last year, I believe it came out, uh, with all the documented uh, rescues and deaths of condors in the last 70 years, and it's it's a staggering number. Uh, mostly, the big numbers is condors that die from poisoning events. Unfortunately, a lot of them were caught in the past also to be sent to zoos, uh, to be sent to private collections. Uh, but now poisoning is the, the main threat. And that poisoning mostly is related to the presence of uncontrolled dogs throughout the countryside. When people poison feral dogs to look after their livestock, the condors and other vultures eat the carcasses and this can wipe out a lot of a small population very quickly. So their sterilization programs, which are much more humane and much more effective, have been a huge success, not only for conservation, but also with the local community. So in 2018, we had a big problem in Cotopaxi province, which is uh, two hours south of here. Uh, where we had a big poisoning event and around 20 condors died uh, that we know of uh, in a very short period of time, in around six months. Uh, directly related to, uh, to dogs attacking domestic livestock and people trying to get rid of those dogs because the government uh, was nowhere to be found and was not doing anything to control the situation. Uh, this was 2018. Uh, in 2022, uh, there was a big case in the same province that, that came out in a lot of newspapers uh, in the country that they were blaming a mountain lion for killing uh, 1,200 sheep in that same province. Uh, it turned out that the 1,200 sheep uh, maybe weren't that many and it was probably 100% directly related to dogs. Uh, that were attacking these sheep all over the province. We can tell what animal attacked uh, the domestic livestock that was killed because of the, the tracks around the area, which areas of the body uh, the predator bit, 
uh, how it started eating. Each animal has their particular markings, you know. Uh, and so it, it is popular, but, you know, the eradicating the feral dogs, that is something that uh, few people do, uh, and most of them do it very quietly, and it, it's impossible for a government official to, to say that, yeah, we need to do this and to go ahead with it, even though it's the, the most important thing to do, uh, especially also because, you know, uh, we all care about uh, the suffering of animals, including dogs and cats, but these dogs are affecting all the native population, all the, they're affecting all the native animals, uh, including condors, our national bird, and, and several other endangered species, and they are not having a good life either. So these dogs are suffering. For every dog that we see that is feral, that ha has survived, maybe 20 other dogs will have died on the way and will have died pretty horrible deaths. So, uh, we need to control this, this situation, definitely. Endangered uh, vulture species, uh, the Andean condor, uh, is not a big concern, it's not a national concern. It's a concern of uh, some people uh, in the society, but some people also in the environmental authority. So there's a big gap between these. How, how does this environmental concern grow? Uh, it grows in a really light way in several aspects, uh, but not in, not in all the ones that we need, and uh, not the ones that we need uh, to take care on this really beautiful and important species. Do you feel like Ecuador says the right things politically about the value of nature? Ecuador says, but uh, there's a big gap between what we say and what we do. Uh, uh, when, when you do something like a declaration, if you say, it, if you say something or if you declare protected areas, uh, this is something that, that, that puts you uh, in the eye of an international uh, forum and they say, okay, you are behaving well because you are declaring protected areas or you are, say, you are saying uh, nature has rights. Yep. Yeah, and I think that we need to, 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 to make this exercise of putting things together. The beautiful things we say and the sad things we are facing now. So let's try to make a mixture between both and uh, we will have something good. And for any of you that are wondering why I was so interested in the vultures of Ecuador, well, hopefully you'll be subscribed to our e-newsletter and to our YouTube channel because all of that will be revealed very soon. <laughs>